Hi guys, thanks so much for joining us. Hi Annette, thank you for joining us. Hi everybody. Sorry that we were a little bit late. We had some technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for to everyone who's shown interest in this topic. I think it's gonna be a really, really interesting one. So I hope that, um, yeah, everyone who's chatted to us beforehand is able to join us today. Um, Pet Petra McAlee, Dee Park, really looking forward to seeing you. Heidi Richardson, I'm going to share your, your question as well about your case. Um, Marnie Krauser, really cool to have you with us if you're joining us live today. Alison Gray, Sandra Thomas, and Sarah Sargood, I'm really excited to have all of you with us um, if you are here. So <clears throat> before we dive right in, if you guys have been following our Facebook Lives, you'll know that I ask everyone a question before we before we jump in and before we get started. So Annette, before we get started, I want to know from you, um, what is the research article that you reference most often or what is the research that's made the greatest impact in your practice and your way of thinking? Uh, there's not one research article. Um, this, I'm, I'm a human physio and I delve into animal physio and equine physio. Uh, so I go online because I'm not a member of a university. All of the articles that I source are public articles, either um, shared by authors or uh, through Facebook or through uh, YouTube and certainly through Science Direct and some of those uh, I haven't sourced one in particular, but my topic of research has been equine biomechanics uh, and um, strength training. And um, um, in particular, my field of uh, special interest in, in looking for research on this topic is weight training for strength and uh, in performance horses more so than in rehabilitation of injured animals. Um, I did find some research from Mark, Margaret Bromley. Uh, wasn't a lot of help. Uh, I have looked at all the articles, Sue Dyson, the real stubs, um, your platform I found extremely helpful, David Markin, um, and from um, any equine specialist, um, physiotherapy. So really not one source of quite a broad range. Dr. David Marlin has a really nice, um, nice page for research. But so I'm, I'm quite. We asked this question because um, this year our theme for the Vetriad Summit is research meets reality, um, and it's really important for us to always think about and consider how what we are doing is related back to the evidence that we have and how that evidence can be used in practice. Um, and so today's topic is actually quite exciting because we have a lecture at the summit that is, um, that's called Isolated Versus Integrated Exercise. Um, and it's really about those differences. And so I'm really excited to, to, to actually dive into the, that topic at the summit. But okay, enough summer chat let's dive into today's topic so annette um thank you for for that will you tell us a little bit about yourself so we're going to be chatting about strength training today in the equine guys um and annette's developed a bit of a program so <clears throat> please introduce yourself and please introduce a little bit about that program uh well i'm an older physio um i've been um, I specialise or, or have a niche market into chronic pain management in middle-aged people. Um, my background is I grew up in a veterinary practice. Both my parents were vets. Uh, in fact, my mother was one of the first female vets actually graduated here in Australia. So that was very exciting for her. Um, both my parents were involved in, um, in horses and um, certainly in competition. Uh, and my history in competition uh, is in three-day eventing and training off-the-track racehorses into eventing. Uh, I did my physiotherapy studies and um, have developed an interest, as most people here, in equine um, rehabilitation and performance training. So uh, having that background, um, also having sadly an experience with a number of injuries with myself and with my horses uh, has got me sparked into strength training. So the beginning of my journey for this uh, research or developing, trying to get a research program going 
uh, and developing the, um, the weight training was started two years ago. I was asked to, uh, I had a horse I was going, uh, that was injured. Uh, he'd been in the paddock three months. Uh, he had a fairly dismal veterinary report. He had bilateral suspensory hind uh, injury. He had kissing spine and he was also diagnosed as a grade one wobbler. Uh, he came to me out of the paddock with his owner asking me to do rehab with him. Uh, his alternative was to be put down. So I started a simple program based on all the veterinary research, the um, integrated walking program. And uh, after 12 weeks with full disclosure, the horse was put on the market. Nobody was interested. The day he was put on the market, I was injured off another horse and completely ruptured all the tendons off my hip, uh, off my seat bone and could hardly move. So I had this beautiful, quiet, injured well not injured but a horse on the on the rehab journey i needed to be rehabbed myself so i bought him i uh, spent another 12 weeks um, we worked together helping uh, developing our own strength and got to a point where i looked at this horse and i thought he's he's developed really well he's sound he's going well but he's got no muscle tone he hasn't got any strength um, to go back to performance. So I looked at myself and thought, well, I would do weight training. So I looked at the horse and thought, right, let's develop a weight training program. So we can't do repetitive uh, work with, uh, you know, get a horse to lift his leg 10 times and do sets of 10. Um, we can't ask the horse to lay down and put his feet in the air. Uh, all of these instructions that we do with humans, we can't do with the horse. So I looked at him and I looked at, and think, well, well, I have to look at developing him strength-wise with a global biomechanical movement. So I looked at his movement, moving parts. I took videos and put them in slow motion and um, kind of came up with the thesis that, or the hypothesis that if I put weight on his moving parts, as in his neck and his hind legs, um, and got him to power walk in straight lines, um, as he had a head nod and as he had his hind legs moving um, with a weight, then we would get recruitment of fibres, we would get um, recruitment and hypertrophy and over a graduated interval training program, same as we would do in a human, um, my hypothesis would this horse would increase in muscle strength, muscle bulk and hopefully go on to increase function and performance. And actually, that's exactly what happened. So um, I don't have the data, the research, the skills. It was all clinical application of my research in muscle strength, tendon loading, my research in um, observation of the biomechanical movements, as well as my online research there. Um, I bought an industrial sewing machine and I started making pads for the legs and pads for the necks. Um, one of the challenges was I only put the weights on the hind leg and the biggest challenge was actually putting a weight around a horse's leg that was safe and comfortable and also functional. So it took a while, but I got there. Um, then I went out to the veterinary schools and looked at the veterinary um, students, hoping to get some research into what I had uh, done, uh, covid uh, many other reasons it just hasn't happened yet. So I've done my own, I've def uh, um, um, developed my own program um, with the research that I have done on my own. And since joining your group, certainly have been much more educated in many areas of equine biomechanics and um, rehabilitation. So now I think it would be fantastic to see um, veterinary uh, student, uh, a veterinary researcher, a physio researcher, look at this topic in detail because my ultimate aim would be to see horses, as much as a weight is a weight, it's still a natural application if performed and applied properly. Um, I think that we can change the way that horses are strengthened without tying them down and forcing them but that needs to be researched with the correct evidence uh, to be put out there and then practiced. Hmm. I really, there are so many things you've said now that I just 
absolutely love. I'm going to dive into some of them. Um, guys, if you're joining us, let us know where you're joining us from. Um, what is your interest in strength training? Have you tried something? Because I think that many of us have tried some different things. And I really love what Annette has developed um, because a lot of us have thought in the same, you know, the same direction, the same line. And um, as one of one of our questions is going to highlight, it's a constant kind of question that comes up. How can I add extra resistance to, to build extra strength in my patient? Um, so if you guys are watching, let me know where you are and what your interest is. Um, and we're also here to answer your questions, right? So we're going to be chatting about this topic. But if you have any questions, then pop them into the into the comments and I'd be happy to answer those for you. Or rather, Annette would be happy to answer them for you. Um, <laughs> so, Annette, I'm really glad that you've benefited from our platform. I, like, it just it makes my heart sing to know that we're achieving our goal, which is just to support rehab therapists all over the world and continuing to learn and grow. Um, and this year specifically focusing on that evidence-based approach and really highlighting that thinking process that you've shown us now of, you know, this is the idea that I have, but is it working? Isn't it working? What are the objective measures we can look at and how can we actually have it properly researched and investigated and published so that we can, yeah, have a, so that there can be a broader application than just what I am doing in my clinic with my patients, but that we can all benefit from that. Um, so hi, Heidi. Thanks for joining us. So she says that um, she's dabbled a bit, but never thought of the horse's neck being part of it. I had the same thought, Heidi. I also hadn't actually thought of using the neck as um, a point to add add weight. So what, what um, and then what, motivated you to use the neck if you wanted to share a little bit more about that um well being an experienced rider as well um feeling the horse move under underneath and uh, power walk and you know coming back to human movement if we dawdle along we don't use a lot we don't recruit many muscles we don't need to be as strong and stable stable through our core um so if you look at a horse power walk he has a head nod so if and then it's a moving part that we i figured we can load um and if we load it um in increments um the the recruitment of fibers if we load a muscle we know is greater so as the horse walks with his head nod and the hind movement so as he lifts and brings the hind leg through his head will move with that hind leg so if we weight the hind leg, every step the horse takes, he needs to recruit more fibres through all of the lifting muscles. He needs to recruit more fibres through the core to stabilise the spine. He needs to bring in more abdominals to elevate the back as he drops his head. Now, if we load the head and neck, then the recruitment of fibres through the core, this is my hypothesis, the recruitment of fibres through the core um, and the the muscles on top of the spine in the neck, not, not the underneath muscles, are the muscles that lift and lower the head. So if we apply a weight in intervals and increments to that part, then again, my hypothesis is that the, we will get greater recruitment of fibres. We will get increased bulk and strength of that moving part. So we've, in the horse, as I said before, we're looking at the full biomechanical pattern I haven't looked at weight in the front legs. Um, I thought there might be a danger element there. I, it's an unknown for me, but I did think weight in the hind legs, particularly with the power coming from the hind the leg, the front legs being more landing um, point. Um, so if we weight, we get recruitment. So that was the pattern that I looked at in detail. Um, and um, uh, then design the weights around that. We know that the horse carries weight on his back um, and we know the weight-bearing structures there that are the safest part. But by increasing the weight on the back, um, as we know, that we, we, there's a lot of research to say that there's a percentage there for the rider versus the horse that's not going to improve the horse in strength. We know that that's possibly going to harm the horse uh, rather than improve strength. So the biomechanical pattern was really um, my target. Yeah, I, 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 
with I agree with Heidi as well. She says it it makes total sense to load the neck. Now you've explained it. It just never occurred to me. And I agree with her. It makes sense the way that you've decided to load um the neck and the hind legs and not the front legs. Um because like you've said, because of that power generation, your your muscle chain coming from the front in from the head and the neck into the hind legs. So um strengthening the back would have an effect there. Um so have you have you played a little bit with where those weights are placed on the neck, for example? more cranially towards the head or more towards the trunk uh yes i have um two of my designs one was a neck um collar design where the um and if i do learn how to get this screen right i'll be able to share that uh it was a collar weight where uh, about five or ten no, about 15 centimeters wide uh, mm -hmm. and a collar weight that just wrapped around the horse's neck and i velcroed it under um i wanted the weight to sit um more or less in the middle, but certainly no higher than C3 or C2 because the structural support there for a weight, I felt just with my research, was not good enough. The other thing is that with levers, the further away the weight is from its um, uh, point of uh, movement is we, we have a greater increase in uh, like the crane. So the horse needs to become the crane. So when we're doing... Um, when we're adding the weight, we certainly want the, the support of that weight to be pretty much midline or, you know, not, yeah, midline. Now, by putting a weight on the top of the neck, the horse has to do the work naturally with some of the use of elastic bands and resistance bands. And certainly we know tying a horse down, uh, any interference with the front, the head and neck blocks the hindquarters so there's no interference with head on neck movement it is neck and head movement on trunk so the front end with the head uh, is free to move so placing the weight you know in the back third or the caudal third is um, I think again coming back to looking at research is certainly the safest and my experience with the horses that I've done it on they they tended to work well with it there. If the weight went any more to the top, to the ears, the horses just put their head down and really didn't cope very well with it. So uh, that was my feedback, not not science, really, visual. Some poor horses just stuck their head down and went, you know, can you take it off? Can you take it off? So some of the problems that I had with um, going maybe a bit too fast was the horses would slow down at the walk. They wouldn't maintain the power wart, so they fatigued. Um, mm -hmm. And one horse just stopped to put his head down and what just took the collar off. I mean, that was a decent sign. You know, he probably could have laid down and had a rest then. But um, so all of the observations were visual um, and common sense feedback. For sure, for sure. I, yo, I love that. So um, we have a comment here from Anne-Marie who says that if only I were ready for post-grad stuff, maybe Charles Stewart would be interested. So be sure to tag Charles so he can come and watch this if he's not here with us. Um, and, yeah, I mean, just to comment on that point, um, none of us really feel like we're in a place where we can do research, right? We all kind of feel... We're really busy in practice. We have we have no cooking clue how to even start. I know that, I mean, that's how I feel. Like, where do I even start? Um, you need yeah. a support structure uh, to be able to really do it well. And, of course, it's kind of a waste of time if you're going to do research and it's not a good quality question and method. You really need it to be fantastic quality so that at the end of the day you're sitting with something that's significant and worth something so if you're interested um anyone who who kind of feels that way this is one of the things we're going to tackle at the summit and try and just help give you guys some tools and resources for how you can take those first steps and become involved in research and certainly join the Facebook Vet Rehabbers research group um, because that's also what that group is there for, is for discussing questions like this. And we're going to share this, this discussion in there as well um, and see if there's anyone in there who's interested to take on this, this topic. But share your questions there, share your ideas there and uh, use the, the support of the community there as a way to help you 
get into this. Um, so if you guys are just joining us, welcome. Let us know where you're from. Um, and we are chatting about a strength training program in equines, specifically one that Annette has developed for her patients. Um, so before we carry on, I have a question from Fiona. Uh, she says she's from New Zealand. Thanks for joining us and loving this webinar. So this is just a, a you know, just a chat, Fiona, definitely not a, a webinar. Um, but I'm really glad you could join us. She has a rehab horse who has atrophied in her quads. She has bone spavin in both hocks. And she's wanting her to develop her quads um, as she will support her stifles and hock, but too much pole work or pull work will make her hock sore. So I've thought of weights on her hind limbs, have not tried anything yet. So would be interested in your thoughts, um, Annette, for this case specifically. Uh, certainly weights, as we all know, will increase the recruit recruitment. And if we're asking the horse to lift and bend, uh, we want to look at both the concentric and eccentric work of the quads. When we add in poles, the horse has to lift higher. So that is more work straight away. And one of the comments that I despise hearing uh, saddle fitters and uh, massage therapists, um, do more poles, do more poles. Like I had my mare saddle fitted and, um, you know, he straight away gave me the best advice, go and do lots of poles. And I thought, well, what does lots of poles mean? No, so I do pole work, but not lots of. So I think adding a weight is probably you can uh, a great way to be able to get the horse to engage in that hind leg stepping activity without it being too high. I suppose one piece of advice: I'll go out and buy some one kilo anchor weights and walk around with them tomorrow. And I think you'll be quite surprised at how much extra work you do. And then go out and do your own polls and see what that does. So adding a weight would certainly increase the recruitment of the fibres. But with um, some structural injury there, my advice would probably be to um, certainly graduate the program and have very you know, um, strong observation as to how your horse is handling it. The maximum weight I've put on horses' hind legs has been two kilos. And the reason I've come up with that is I simply couldn't put more weight on the hind legs without them slipping or becoming dangerous or, in some cases, the weights fell out. Um, and the boots that I've designed could only carry that, but the horses seemed to tolerate that and it did make a significant difference over a period of time in... Um, increasing that bulk and function and stride length. So coming back to the quads, it's not just a matter of targeting the quads in the horse, it's a matter of targeting the whole chain of stability. Um, we, we can't target one muscle in strengthening, in my opinion, in horses because we can't ask them to stand on one leg for 30 seconds. We can't ask them to do repet. So everything they do has got to be bilateral, symmetrical, um, and uh, recruit that whole chain of uh, stability. So, yes, the other thing I'd do is put a chain, a little bell around their leg, around their fetlock, and get that uh, proprioception um, and um, I call it neuroplastic, uh, do new, what's called neuro neuroplasticity training in my human, and I get them to count. Um, that's another thing I've done with my horses. I, they don't count, but... Um, if I want more activity in one leg than another or um, a bit of an input, I will tap on the hock or the knee um, as that horse steps through, uh, not just tap as a sensory input. And that can, again, in, once they get the pattern correct, they can uh, increase or um, focus on that movement. So, yeah, it's worth a try. I, I really like that. I think that's a really good um, technique is just giving some some input mm. into that leg as it's stepping forward or as, you know, as that muscle should be recruiting, just a tap, tap. I love that. I love that. Mm. Um, so, so Heidi, I'm going to just share Heidi's question here. Are there any contraindications for the strength training? I'm thinking sacroiliac injury, as I'm seeing a lot of SR problems with atrophy of one side middle gluteal. Uh, there's certainly contraindications and in that case you would need to work closely with um, 
well-educated vet rehabbers. Um, again, it's very hard to target one area for strength training in a horse because they just don't do one side. But if you're going to get try and get the symmetry of uh, uh, restore that symmetry on the weak side back up to the strong side, we still need to work the horse in um, equal stepping. So, again, my hypothesis would be if you weight maybe uh, one side up very gently, again, for that proprioceptive input, it doesn't make sense to weight up the weak side and not the strong side because the weak side will then struggle more and probably lag behind. So to strengthen the horse, again, just my hypothesis would be to weight it equally, but do the tapping on the leg that is, is lagging so that the horse is, again, the importance of the training would be symmetrical uh, and equal stepping rather than targeting just the one side. So in a nutshell, everything I kind of do is come back, the weakest point is your starting point, but make it symmetrical um, in your training. Don't try and just target the one area. Mm. I think that's really interesting because for sure my thoughts are, I'm sure most of our thoughts are exactly going in this direction of saying, mm. if I have a, a weaker side, could I just add a little bit more weight to make it a little bit more challenging on that side um, and then try and strengthen and catch that side up to the other side um so uh, and like saying that obviously you can't just work one side of the horse like you've said but you can add you can add a little bit more resistance a little bit more stress um and incrementally increase that until we've caught up to the other side in my mind so it's interesting that you are saying um you wouldn't do that that you would keep it symmetrical yeah mm. so bring the the strong side back to be symmetrical with the weak side. The other thought that I would have on that and another thing I do with, with various horses is with my pole work, um, instead of asking the horse to step, you know, step, pole, 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 I will, I do, I call it controlled stepping. So, and I do it with my pupils. So we set up a line of, of poles um, and if you leave the horse to do it on his own, um, if you're fairly observant, what you'll probably notice is that the horse will always lead with one leg. Now, I used to be a high jumper in my athletic days and I'd lead with one leg. I couldn't jump with the other leg. So horses are very similar. Um, again, my hypothesis that if we let the horse arrive at the pole without any interference, I have discovered that they tend to lead with one foreleg more often than the other. So if we have our pole set up so that he leads with the weak and the rider or the handler leads with the weak leg. Um, we've got a lifting off and a push from the other leg and a landing on that weak leg. But we also want to make sure that we've got, again, symmetry that he leads with the other leg. Mm -hmm. And the distancing of your poles is not necessarily step, 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 but it might be step, one step, step over the pole so that every time the horse he might do, say, a set of five poles leading with only the left leg and then alter it so he leads with the right leg, then alter it so he leads left, right, left, right. Now, the other thing I've got access to is different, uh, and most people can do this, is vary the heights of the pole um, mm -hmm. so that the horse, you know, he does have to work. But again, coming back to symmetry um, and um, the proprioceptive feedback in or the neuroplasticity training is a little bit of a tap um, um, I had was looking at a horse that had lost an eye so teaching the rider not just to use feel but a click prior to the tap uh, and you know we had great success training that horse mm, I love that I love that so Heidi I think that answers um, the question that you asked in the group where you also were speaking about um, gluteal asymmetry and weighting one side um so i'm not i'm not going to ask that question because i think we've handled that but um if you guys missed this video so annette shared this little video um with us and i'm just popping that in the comments so that you can have a look at it when we're done but it goes into a bit more detail on what the what the weights look like um how they're used what the program looks like um and that's what i 
would like to chat about now, feel free to pop your questions in, guys, if you have cases you're struggling with or if you have questions about how this would work and how you would apply it. Um, or if you're interested in taking on the research, then let us know in the comments. Um, but <laughs> very exciting. Uh, but it, it, for a little bit, what these what these weights actually look like and what you've made them from. Uh, the the actual weights I ended up with steel cylinders cut down to uh, seven centimeter uh, ten centimeters long. Um, and each side on the boots, it's got a pocket. Um, the boots are rectangular, so they sit around the rectangular shape of the horse's hind shin. Uh, and each side, there's a little pocket, and the the um, underneath surface is lined with a grip stop, uh, a rubber grip. Then I have a padded uh, section so that the, the weights don't sit flush on the horse's leg. Um, then there's two pockets each side and I can put one, two or three weights in each side. So I can start off with an empty weight, get the horse used to it. I've got one horse here at the moment that won't tolerate them at all. Um, then we add in one weight and each of the weights weights 300 grams. Uh, again, looking at symmetry. So we start with nothing, then go to 600 grams, add two more weights, add two more weights up till we get to two kilograms on each hind leg. Um, and it is Velcroed on, then there's a cinch that goes around the leg and then it's pulled tight. So the I haven't, I've had a couple of incidents where the bag, the uh, boots have slipped a little bit, we've had a little bit of rubbing. Um, other than that, um, they, they, they've been really quite successful. So, but these are boots that I've made all of these off my, with my industrial sewing machine. I've um, explored different materials. Um, basically, I've ended up with a quality vinyl because it's hard wearing, easy to clean, uh, doesn't rip um, and has longevity. The part that does seem to wear is the Velcro. So, um, but I was not really keen to put strong leather straps on uh, just in case, you know, something happened, the Velcro would probably tear and, and easy to get off. It's a quick slip, but a, vel a leather strap with a buckle, um, I didn't, I didn't explore that. But um, um, and the neck weights were made with canvas and vinyl. The collars had a a um, specific amount of sand. Um, started with one, two, three, four four kilos, uh, so they were each uh, a set weight, whereas the neck pad, again, I designed it around similar theme to the boots where I had pockets where I could put a steel weight in. Um, and with the bigger horses, we could actually go up to about six, uh, seven kilos. Um, again, with research, we would be able to establish um, with, with better evidence how much is needed the other thing I did with not just the movement, I also looked at isometric training, whereas when I saddled the horse up, I would put on the big horse like seven kilos around his neck um, and I would time that with a maximum of, of five minutes because we know isometric work is um, much more difficult than dynamic work and then take it off. And I did find that that helped and uh, really bogged up the muscles quite quickly uh, had quite good recruitment. Then when we went out and did the walking, we had, um, you know, a muscle warmed up basically, but no more than, you know, five minutes. And, of course, as the weights increased, the time with the weights on decreased, just as we were doing human training. Oh, mm. I really, really like that. Um, so what does the what does the, the, your program look like? What does – you've mentioned it's about 12 weeks. What are you doing during that time? Yeah. Again, uh, based around a weight training program, say for a human athlete, uh, we, I started with, first up, uh, the horses that I, apart from Cody, the first horse I started with, the others have all just been off the track, not harmed horses, but certainly not in good shape, you know, the, the uh, no top line, um, the U back, the head high, uh, you know, quite significant muscle imbalances. So we would, I'd start them off basically uh walking just a couple of days of just getting them to power walk because even these horses wouldn't even power walk you know they walked along with their head their backs arched their heads up and you know short strides um 
I would add the weights on their legs with nothing in them, again, to get them used to and start with 20 minutes, 30 minutes in hand a day. So I did a lot of walking and um, then I went to two kilos on the neck for, I figured, again, observation, these horses cope with it really well. So about 30 minutes a day with two kilos on their neck and maybe 300 grams, 600 grams in their um, in the boots on the legs. Um, and every five days, every seven days, they had two days of no weights, one day of nothing and one day of no weights, but five days of weights. Uh, week two, right through to week 12, basically increased the, um, the weights gradually from two to three kilos, increased the time frame, say, from 30 to 40 minutes on some days back to 30 minutes on other days. If I discovered the horses were having any um, resistance to it, they'd have a day off. But basically over six to eight weeks, I would get them up to um, up to two kilos in their hind legs fairly quickly over two weeks, and then that would stay the same. And then depending on the size and how strong or weak the horse was, I would increase the weight from two kilos up to five or six kilos. Some horses didn't even get that high. Um, and the time frame was basically 20 to 30 minutes a day, only at the walk. I never got these horses out of a walk. One, because I felt it was dangerous to have that amount of uh, maybe mobile weight. You know, we have a lot of mobile riders, but, you know, that's not for my me to um, delve into. But by adding a weight on their neck and the biomechanics changed from the walk to the trot and the canter. So, again, I was not looking at how um, I think the benefits came from the walking only and it was certainly safe. So over 12 weeks, we just get up to, um, I mean, you can go on forever with it, but uh, a maximum of up to about five kilos. Um, sometimes that was only three times a week with two kilos on other days, but five days of weights, two days off, uh, or two, one day of no weights and one day of no work at all. But again, that, you know, the, the person applying it certainly has to observe. Mm -hmm. And also adding in a little bit of isometric work when I um, <clears throat> saddled them up. I did add in riding with the weights on, but again, only at the walk and added in poles and added in hill work. Um, going down a hill was interesting with a horse with weights on. They really did have to work hard. So if they work too hard, you just, you, I mean, again, observation, you back right off uh, because you can all, always build a muscle that is weak. You've got to wait and wait for a muscle that's harmed to heal, and that's just time. So anyone who's doing this, they do need to get um, do it in hand, um, not just get on the horse's back and, and walk with weights on. Certainly it's a, it's a program that needs input, not just, um, you know, trail riding with weights on. I, lo I really like it. I really like it. So Alison says necessity is the mother of invention. And I'm sure we can all agree with that. <laughs> um, have yeah. you had this program to own it for them to do with, with their horses? Or have you basically been the one to do this with, with your patients? Uh, I've got a few people who've taken on the program under supervision. Uh, again, these are horses that are just weak. Um, performance horses, these are not horses that have been injured requiring rehab and veterinary supervision. So it's performance training, uh, strength, strength training in performance horses. Um, certainly there's a place there for rehabilitation. But mostly I have done it on my own horses uh, because I'm still experimenting with it. I have under supervision had people go through it, you know, we've done it together. Um, but I haven't put it out there as a commercial thing. I had a couple of people buy it and um, and take it on, but certainly before, you know, can re again, coming back to evidence-based, I can say, look, it's evidence-based, it's safe, it works, based on science, um, and, and certainly the program is what I've put together. I'm certain out there there's people that can improve on it significantly, and um, I'm open for that because the benefits, I think, in the long term, what I call natural strength training, if we can change the way horses are trained and not harmed, 
I mean, certainly there's potential for harm for this if people think they can suddenly throw a weight on and get their horse, you know. Same as tie-downs. We've seen horses tied down severely and, and um, we know it's cruel. So weight training could be cruel too. It has to be, you know, supervised correctly. Yes, for sure, for sure. Um, so Anna Marie says, great work, Annette, very innovative. And, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think many of us agree. So, uh, But like you've said, weight, weight training is not necessarily without risks. And it, they can, mm. they are super dangerous. And I love that you've really highlighted during this discussion the safety component um, and how you've kind of taken that into account throughout the not only throughout the development, but also in the in the individual horses program, um, and yeah, I mean, I'm I'm preaching the to the converted, but we must always take safety into account. Um, so I love that, guys. If there are any more questions from you from your side, please share them now. Um, if you're interested in learning more, please get hold of us directly. I think that's the best option. Um, and let's. Yeah, let's get some evidence behind this because at the end of the day, that's the only way we're going to know what exactly we're achieving by using the weight um, and what our so what our goals of rehabilitation can be by by incorporating them into a program um, and what those safety parameters are, um, what the different things are that we can play with. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And is there anything else from your side that you want to share with with our listeners? Uh, if you're interested in dabbling with this, certainly, you know, use your own education, common sense. I'm certainly, there's a lot of people out there a lot smarter and um, tuned in than I am. Um, if the concept has tweaked some ideas uh, and get in contact with me, I can show you the boots. If I had a bit more tech savvy, I could share my screen, but I don't know how. Um, I'm good at what I do. I'm not good at everything I do. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm just really excited that um, I've got interest. It's just been a hard slog for the last two years with COVID. We're in lockdown here at the moment. Um, and um, it's been really difficult getting people to actually look at the program. Um, so any uh, comments, any suggestions, any um, questions, um, but certainly use your knowledge and be safe. Uh, the priority is the safety of the horse, but the long-term benefits. Uh, I'm really excited at what you know, what what mm. the, the the veterinary world, physio world, can do to offer not just rehabilitation of horses that are injured, but the performance world. Um, mm. I think that um, any information going in there that can enhance training um, with uh, better functionality in the way our horses are performing, um, mm. and not just you know, put a massage machine on at the end of the day or run a little machine over them or and say that that's, you know, it's if a horse is strong um, and um, got good function, then then you've got a great athlete. And um, yeah. that's really, really, and, you know, I'm, I've been a three-day eventer uh, and the amount of hours, time and money going into these horses, um, the performance is what we're after. So... You know, and strength is it. You know, we all come on strong, 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 and you're not going to do it with a tie down. We know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, but this program is quite about sorry. you know performance, right? Um, while, while all the horses are at the Olympics, so really exciting. Mm -hmm. If that's flooding your guys, mm -hmm. food, it's flooding mm -hmm. mine. I'm loving seeing all the Olympic horses arriving um, and the the premises. Yeah. Just sorry, one yeah. comment on if. If the, I think the, um, I mean, I'm heavily into the competition world, the training world, and I've seen, you know, what everybody does and, you know, I've been guilty of my own little sidetracks and, and shortcuts. Uh, this program does require dedication by the handler, the rider, uh, and it does have to have a correct application. It's not a matter of putting... Um, you know, lunging the horse for 20 minutes and going, yeah, that's it. It actually, again, with the better research applied to it, uh, it has to take a dedicated program. And we know in our physio research and our physio training with our, with our patients that if we stop loading, then we have muscle um, wasting, well, not so much wasting, but we need to uh, not just strengthen for the performance but every time a horse comes back in from a break we have to start again 
Um, mm. and, and again, this needs to be paid attention and, and educated. You don't just come back in and put a horse into a competition. Um, we need that strength training and not just how, but certainly the education on the, the, the importance of strength training to not just prevent injury, but for performance. So, yes, yeah, so I'm very excited that um, and I, I know this program works, but I'd love to see it proven scientifically. So um, Fiona wants to know if you sell the weights. Uh, yes, I do. Um, we've just had a little bit of controversy here in South Australia with the Veterinary Act having to reword their, um, their act. Um, so for the, the weights to be, to the, the program to be sold as a rehabilitation, it probably needs to be uh, referred, the person applying it would need to be under veterinary supervision. Uh, in my opinion, if you are, again, I'm looking at performance horses for strength training, not rehabilitation post-injury, so I'm applying a sports physio type application, I can sell it under that umbrella. So yes, I do. Um, I would, uh, selling the pads will be easy. Selling the weights apply um, puts a lot of weight in the postage but I can certainly direct people on getting your own weights, uh, buying them in your city rather than sending, you know, 15 kilos of weight through the post in steel. So, yes, I can do that in the short okay. answer. <laughs> okay, so Sarah, Sarah Sargood says, thank you. I hope to be able to see you soon, Annette, with at least one of my horses and myself. So, awesome. Beautiful. <laughs> Um, and Heidi says, thank you. Brilliant talk. Loved it. Brain ticking over now. So thank you so much, Annette, for joining me today. This has really been interesting. Thank you. I've loved it. And yeah, I'm just so excited to be involved in something that I think can make such change and to be, uh, again, involved with the group, your group, uh, with, with what you provide. It's just fantastic. And it certainly changed my education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, thank you for joining us live. It's always great to have you. If you're watching this as a recording, feel free to share your questions and your comments and we'll come back to them. Um, I have one more comment. Let me see. Thank you for sharing your ex expertise and knowledge. Music to my ears. Thank you. And some more thank you. So awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Bye. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>